This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 858, recorded on January 25th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's a fairly typical winter day here, 38 Fahrenheit, 3C, and just kind of, you know, clouds blowing through. We've gotten snow the last two nights, but it's only been half inch, so they don't even bother plowing. Missed you for a couple of weeks, Alan. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, out of circulation. Actually, we, we miss your cat. Oh yeah. Well, I've got the, this week. I have the other cat who um, he's uh, he's kind of hyper, so he may <laughs> dart in and then dart out again. Well, he fits perfectly into Twiv, right? Yes, exactly. He digresses a lot. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, we've got uh, fifty-two cloudy, another meh day, uh, and more of the same in the future. From Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, everyone. We have uh, 40 degrees uh, cel- uh, for Fahrenheit, excuse me, uh, for Celsius. It uh, seems to be pretty sunny out there. Um, so another day of winter. It's four degrees Celsius, partly cloudy here. I have to look at my phone because my windows are boarded up. Well, with the, uh, with the uh, clouds, I won't have a Tinkerbell with me today. No. Oh. That's the, oh, right. the when the yes. sun comes through. Uh, Rich uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kathy calls it Tinkerbell. That Tinkerbell. lands on my shoulder at some point. Yeah, now. it starts off in the back, a big bright spot yeah. on the wall. It's funny. Yeah, no, you you got good lighting today. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our guest today is from uh, the National Institutes of Health. He is the director of the Vaccine Research Center. John Mascola, welcome to TWIV. Great to be here, Vincent. I'm a big fan. Uh, it's uh, 43 degrees Fahrenheit here in Bethesda. Wind from the north, going to get very cold very soon. Uh, partly cloudy. Yeah, you and I have been corresponding a bit. Um, you, you, uh, um, I, so that's how I learned that you listen to TWIV, which is really nice. I, we appreciate it. Probably Tony doesn't listen to TWIV because he's too busy, but. Probably. Which is not to say you're not, but. Uh, it, there's some things you can learn, I suppose. You could learn the weather in Madison, New Jersey, yeah. for example. Well, That's actually, what everyone was, wants to know. <laughs> I was going to say, John, you can, you can tell that he's a genuine listener because he already had the weather queued, queued up and was ready yeah. to give That's it right. back in with it. That's so, right. That's somebody who knows the show. I first listened to um, Daniel Griffin's clinical updates because I am a, mm-hmm. a trained in infectious disease, but no longer practice. And they were very useful to me. Yeah. But then you you all had uh, discussions on things like the furin cleavage site and the lab leak hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And it was just enormously educational to me. So I, I am a big fan. Good. We're glad to hear it. I wish more people would be, but that's the way it is. Um, anyway, uh, John, we'd, we'll talk about the VRC and vaccines, but first, I'm curious as to your uh, education and training, and I can't tell where you're from in the U.S. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I am from Massachusetts, ah. Northern Massachusetts ah. but the accent has slowly slipped away. What what part of Mass are you from? Uh, a town called North Andover, close to the okay. New Hampshire border. Yeah. And when I go back, the accent comes back a little bit. <laughs> so, so that's nice. Did you, did you, you went to high school there, I presume. Where'd you go to college? I went to college at Tufts University, got a bachelor's in, in biology, and actually did my very first research on um, interleukin-1 in a laboratory of uh, Harry Bernheim, who was studying the pathogenesis of fever. And that's really like where I got the bug, I think. Uh, we would culture macrophages and try to test, test in rabbits to see if we had endogenous pyrogen and, and all of that. Um, so that's where it started, Yeah. Uh, what department was that in? Do you remember? It, it, it was a medium-sized liberal arts college, so it was a general department of biology. Biology, okay. Yeah. Uh, we had a guest on TWIP a couple of weeks ago, and she has a podcast, actually in Boston, called The Febrile Podcast. <laughs> you get feverish listening to it, I guess. Yeah, it's a hot uh, show. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Were you always interested in science? 
I think so. Yes. The, the only decision for me, I think early on was whether I would do it from a medical career or th uh, through a PhD. But so even when I went to medical school, I knew that uh, my intention was to do some, I didn't know exactly, but I had an interest in biomedical research. Do you have any science in the family? Not formal medical science, um, engineering, mathematics type science. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you went to college with already the idea of going to medical school then, right? Yes. Yeah. I, went, I went to Tufts and uh, went to Georgetown University for medical school. And there I took a Navy scholarship to pay for medical school. I think at that age, that's about all I really knew that I was doing. It turned <laughs> out to be a, a really fantastic pathway. I spent uh, 15 years as a Naval medical officer, albeit 14 of those years in hospitals. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they let me do um, medicine and research. And one of those years uh, as a shipboard medical officer, which was a tremendous amount of fun, and actually gave me an enormous respect for people who, um, who are in the military and do that for a living. What sort of ship? I was on a destroyer um, accompanying a, a battleship and, uh, in the Western Pacific. And so that was an extraordinarily different and, and fun experience. When was that? 1986. Okay. So you, I mean, you all remember the days when the battleship New Jersey would be recommissioned mm -hmm. or brought back to be used. And of course, it has to be escorted by um, support ships and destroyers. So uh, we were the destroyer squadron supporting a battleship. And uh, I had very little to do except, you know, keep people's teeth and psych psyches healthy. Over at sea and that kind of <laughs> Great. So I guess most of the time you were not at sea, right? You were in, in port? Most of the time we were in port. Yeah. Um, and the vast majority of my Navy time was either in, in a hospital as a Navy physician or they, I was very fortunate that the Navy let me go on to do medical research. And at that time, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, mm -hmm. which is an Army lab, had the most cutting edge research. They had started a division of retrovirology mm. in the AIDS epidemic. And I asked if I could work there just for a year. Uh, they let me work there for seven or eight years. Uh, that's really where I got my first scientific experience. So it was very uh, generous of the Navy to actually lend you to the army. It was. <laughs> was your, good for my career, but it was. It was, <laughs> was your post-medical training uh, sort of broadly internal medicine or specifically infectious disease or what? It was internal internal medicine and then a subspecialty in infectious disease. In the last year of that, you go into the laboratory. And then after that, I went um, mostly full-time in the laboratory with a small amount of medical work. Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, in terms of patients, was it mostly infectious disease? Yes. The, when I practiced it, which I did uh, until about five or a few more years ago, it was all infectious disease because it's possible to, to do infectious disease medicine as a consultant. Right. And work for a month, a year, and then the remainder of the time one can do your lab work. Okay. Right. All right. So you seven, eight years working on HIV, but you're also you're still seeing pa patients at the same time, right? Yes. Yes. Which, what did you do next? So I um, in about 1999 is when NIH decided they were going to um, build a vaccine research center, and I remember still to this day that um, there was an advertisement. It was either in Science or the New England Journal of Medicine. And I ripped it out and I put it on my bulletin board. It said NIH Vaccine Research Center. And it was at that time, it was really founded as an AIDS-centered vaccine research center. And I was doing, as I was talking to Brian about earlier, I was doing uh, AIDS-related research. So I, I remember thinking that's for me. Um, and I, um, so I joined as one of the founding investigators this new vaccine research center, which was really started by uh, discussions by Harold Varmus, Tony Fauci, and others. And they had this, and a lot of other people, and then senior investigators, Bill Paul and others at NIH, had this concept of starting an AIDS vaccine research center where basic science investigation could be paired or together with translational capabilities. And so they founded this and advertised for investigators. Uh, Gary Nabel was the first uh, founding uh, director. And he recruited a number of us, and we worked it out that I would be um, the principal deputy director. I think mainly because uh, Gary knew that I could do all the, the footwork, you know. And I actually, I had some government experience, so I sort of knew the bureaucracy. So I started at the Vaccine Research Center in 2000. And, and I gather part of the rationale for the VRC was to get concepts from the basic science lab through the so-called Valley of Death to the point where somebody might actually be willing to commercialize it, right? Exactly. And it took us a while to get there, but I think now what we emphasize uh, among the things that we do is um, we emphasize first in human studies. 
we can take a discovery, whether it's primarily one from here or collaboratively with, with other investigators, and we can make it in, a, in a, a pilot plant. We can make GMP material. So not commercial grade material, but clinical GMP material. And we, can, and we have a um, vaccine clinic on the campus. So we can make the product. We can do the, the phase one study. And we have a vaccine immunology group um, run by some human immunologists, uh, Kaup and Adrian McDermott and, and Bob Cedar and others. So we can do state-of-the-art uh, immune monitoring in the phase one. And that sort of cycle is something we've really emphasized. Cool. So, so that, did, that's go ahead. It's okay. That that sort of takes you, in my understanding, to the uh, edge of the valley of death. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's not it quite. Seems to me that the valley of yeah. death is when you get to phase two because it's so expensive. Phase two and phase three. Uh, and we talk about this all the time about how there's a there's a a gap there where uh, it's hard to get companies. Uh, interested in spending that much money on a potential failure. And so there needs to be some sort of mm, maybe government funding to get you through that uh, before it can be uh, truly commercialized. So uh, VRC doesn't take you through that gap, right? Well, that's exactly right, Rich. And we learned that lesson the hard way where we took some, what we thought were really interesting products through phase one and there wasn't commercial interest. In some cases, you may be talking about Ebola or um, you know, West Nile virus or something. And so there's a couple of ways we've addressed that. Uh, one is there is an entity in the government called BARDA, the Biomedical right. Advanced Research and Development Authority, that can fund advanced development. Okay. BARDA requires a commercial partner to fund. So we, we learned um, some years ago to emphasize trying to find commercial partners early. And so, you know, at NIH, we can do our, our research, cooperative research and development agreement. So the earlier we can find an interested partner, the better, so that we try to avoid that, um, the, the phase two and commercial value of death that you described. I'm guessing you learned a tremendous amount from Operation Warp Speed in this regard that can be applied in the future. Yes. I mean, in so many ways, and that, that's kind of a, a long story, but um, we learned a tremendous amount about how the private sector thinks, about what incentives are, about Boy, I mean, you know, manufacturing and uh, what 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 the incentives are. So, yes, th there'll be lessons learned from that. I think that in multiple directions, but that will be helpful to our center for a long time. Right. Great. So, so what, what, you you ahead. mentioned that VRC sort of was founded to be thinking about HIV vaccine research, and of course, that's that's the part that I am the most familiar with. Um, what other vaccines has VRC been working on? And when did VRC start working on things outside of HIV? Right. So early on, there were a few. So the, what, the model we have had from the beginning, which was Gary Nabel's insight, and it really has worked well for the whole time, is he first and foremost wanted to recruit outstanding scientists. But he wanted scientists who could do independent investigation with an interest in some kind of vaccine-related questions. So we had, a, you know, sort of clinical trained virologists like myself. We had structural biologists like Peter Kwong, uh, immuno basic immunologists like Bob Cedar, uh, Rick Kaup and others. So, but um, we built into that. And so many of those folks did HIV, but others did, some did filovirus work on Ebola, Bob did uh, malaria and tuberculosis work and others. Um, and we built in the translational part over the years. Um, so, now, so we now we emphasize we do HIV still vaccines and antibodies. Influenza, improved influenza vaccines is a major focus. Um, filovirus has been a major focus. So Ebola and Marburg vaccines, as well as antibodies, therapeutic antibodies, respiratory viruses. So RSV that Barney Graham started, and there's a very nice RSV vaccine candidate. You probably know that story. And we've done some chikungunya. Um, malaria antibodies are a big part of the program now. So it, it's not a huge number of targets, but it's largely infectious disease targets, not all viruses. And we, we pick areas where our investigators have expertise and where we think we can make a difference. I think that's kind of the general rule. So when, you, when, the, when the VRC was established, did it draw investigators not only from outside, but also from within NIH? Did some move physically to be part of it? Both. Uh, there was an emphasis on a wide search. Uh, so Bob Cedar was with Bill Paul. 
he joined, but most uh, of the investigators came from outside, um, academic, mainly academic areas, and in my case, um, another government laboratory. So did, did Barney Graham move there, or did he stay in his own? Barney, Barney came from, Van, uh, from Vanderbilt. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Barney came, actually, you know, Barney had both an H, um, RSV, of course, RSV, mm-hmm. pathogenesis mm-hmm. laboratory, but he also was an expert in HIV clinical trials. And Barney was one of these people, still is, he has an MD and a PhD, and he has this amazingly broad uh, scope of knowledge. And so he was um, tasked with starting our vaccine clinic in addition to doing his primary RSV mm-hmm. investigation. So he did both. Uh, he retired recently, right? He did. Barney retired recently. He had been talking about that for a number of years. We thought he was bluffing, you know, uh, <laughs> No, I'm not kind of joking, but he, you know, it was his plan at some point in time. And I think he just found it, um, you know, he was, of course, was pivotal in so many ways. He really led our thinking in uh, pandemic mm-hmm. preparedness and, of course, coronaviruses. I think he felt it was just a, it was the right time after the, the work on the COVID pandemic. I really want to get him on TWIV. You, th- you think he'd do it? I think he would. Yeah. I think if you, yes. Because he he's would. had, as you say, an incredible career. So we have to hear. People need to hear about it. You know, can't be kept yeah. secret. <laughs> <laughs> I I think you people would find it fascinating. Yeah, um, when um, when the VRC was first founded, I know Peter Kwong was at Columbia. He was a postdoc with Wayne Hendricks, and he was looking at a position at Columbia. And he decided to go to the VRC because um, he thought he could do more practical. Fortunately, stuff. yeah, yeah. Fortunately for the VRC, and fortunately for me, um, I've developed a years long extraordinary collaboration with Peter. Um, to the point where, uh, you know, Brianna will laugh, people sometimes would mistake me for a structural biologist and I was going to say, <laughs> no, I just, I just work with Peter Kwong. Uh, and I picked up a, f- a few terms here and there. But, you know, I, I was studying um, protective immunity, mainly on the antibody side for HIV. And Peter had mm-hmm. solved the crystal structure of GP120 in Wayne's lab and then went on w- with some others in the country to, to do um, you know, the full trimeric structure of the HIV envelope like a protein. So by pairing... The, the basic the virology and the you know the viral immunology with the structural biology we really could get at mechanism of mm. virus neutralization so it's been a fun and extraordinary uh, collaboration with Peter Free for a long time. I have to ask you uh, what what are your thoughts about an HIV vaccine? Are we going to keep trying or are we giving up? The more I study other viruses, I hate to say this, maybe the more <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> one becomes well, not so much pessimistic when you realize where HIV sits on the spectrum and it's really at a far end of the spectrum. Um, you know, and, and it actually you, one learns a lot from study. So in, in learning and studying RSV with Barney, you look in, and Barney off, often pointed out that RSV and influenza and Ebola and HIV and coronaviruses are all type one fusion protein uh, entry mechanisms. So they're trimeric glycoproteins uh, with a native trimeric configuration, although they, you know, they do differ in a lot of ways. But you know, RSV is, has very little glycosylation, changes you know, very little. Um, influenza has moderate glycosylation, obviously antigenically diverges somewhat. Coronavirus may be in between the two. It, you know, it has some glycosylation more, more down towards the base. But there's all this protein surface. And when we studied RSV, recently with Barney and, and looked at the B cell repertoire, there are hundreds and hundreds of, line, of lineages that go all over the RSVF protein. And I assume it would be similar as people are studying spike, but HIV is so covered with glycans and so hard to target. It's just, I think it's a tremendously difficult target. Plus it also seems to me that you need a vaccine that'll confer sterilizing immunity, which is a yeah. really high bar. Yes, I think that's the other pivotal point. We recently did an antibody passive prophylaxis study, a large phase 2B study with an antibody that came out of our center, and it neutralizes pretty well. But, you know, as, as we learn more, it probably neutralizes or so only about half of the clinical isolates out there of HIV at a reasonable potency. And we gave it to people, and it at the end of the day, the, 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 the result was not statistically significant in, in ability, ability to prevent acquisition of infection. But the study was designed in a way that you would measure all the virus isolates that infected people. And one, one would look at the sensitivity, and we found what, what was, was the hypothesis, which was the infections that occurred 
in people who got the antibody were the were the more resistant viruses. So there was a sieving, you would call it. But it, it, it got at what you're saying, which was the bar to actually completely block an infection in HIV, it requires an antibody that's very potent or the other side of the coin or, or a virus isolate that's particularly sensitive. If you don't have that, you can't block. Yeah. Right. And, and of course, because of uh, the issue of viral latency, any virus that gets through uh, is going to be a problem. Yep. Yes. Yep. That's a tough one. Yeah. All right. So, um, you, you had sent me this lovely perspective by yourself, Karen Box, Sandra Sitar, and Barney Graham, Accelerated COVID-19 Vaccine Development Milestones, Lessons, Prospects, which is open access. So I, I want everyone to go read it because it's a wonderful summary of what you did. And I wonder if you could give us the, an overview of how VRC responded to COVID. When, what was roughly the timeline? What did you have to overcome and how did you get it done? Sure, and I'll start mainly with our, the, the internal VRC work. But um, so I think people now know the story that Barney Graham had started a really small coronavirus subgroup. So he, he was studying respiratory syncytial virus. He hired a, a postdoc who's become pretty well known now, Kizmekia Corbett, recently took a job at Harvard. And she and literally a couple of post back students were just doing a small amount of coronavirus work. But the reason was that Barney. In a, and we were concerned that there were, had been two outbreaks of a coronavirus, and we wanted to be in that space doing some MERS work. So, and we had designed some MERS vaccine candidates, and I think people now know the story of stabilizing coronavirus spike proteins, which was a collaboration with Andrew Ward's lab and Jason McClellan's lab that really culminated in all that work. Um, so when the 2020 outbreak came, and Barney was immediately on it, as soon as the virus sequence was on virologic.org and, and available. You know, we were looking at it and scanning the area where the two prolines uh, you know, should be inputted and seeing that that area was quite conserved between SARS-1 and MERS. So immediately with Jason McClellan, who'd been, who trained actually with Peter Kwong and is now of course an outstanding investigator for many years in his own right. Immediately with Jason, we began making the, the S2P, the two proline spike and um, started a collaboration with Moderna to make the RNA. And the Moderna story is, is a separate story, but we had been working with Moderna on RNA since Zika times. And so we had this nice collaboration with them and they had indicated before the outbreak an interest to work with us on pandemic viruses, something to emerge to try to actually in an accelerated way, make an RNA. So they were ready to go. And so we were able to um, make the spike protein, start animal studies by February, RNA was immunizing mice. Um, Moderna would made the clinical RNA within 30 or so days and it got into a clinical study within 60 days. And so that started the story. And then, you know, in parallel to all that was all kinds of biologic investigation, non-human primate studies that Bob Cedar and others did. Um, so that really was the, the vaccine effort that continues to this day is, you know, we're studying, you know, uh, the new variants, we're studying mechanisms of immunity, what happens in the lung, memory, and all of that. But you had clearly decided to focus on mRNA and not any other kind of vaccine, right? Yes, and um, a number of reasons for that. We actually made um, a cell line, a Cho cell line with S2P protein, but it gets back to what Rich mentioned earlier. You know, it's a, we knew it was pretty quickly that it was an epidemic and a pandemic, and one needs a partner. And the prior work with Moderna gave us a lot of insights. They had done a clinical trial in Zika. We did DNA uh, with the Zika, you know, pre, pre ME protein, and they did RNA. And what we could get with four milligrams of DNA, they could get with 40 micrograms of RNA. And it was pretty clear, you know, we had tried really hard with DNA. Uh, so we were fans of nucleic acid but we, it was pretty clear to us that mRNA had potential as long as there was some early reactogenicity with RNA, they had to figure out and the lipid nanoparticles had to be figured out. But so I think it was that, that collaboration and the speed of that platform that suggested we go that route. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, how this was accelerated compared to other vaccines? And did you have sort of an idea of what would happen if there was a pandemic and kind of how you might accelerate something beforehand or did this just sort of happen? We had, um, again, a lot of this was is Barney's, to Barney's credit, 
Barney would come to me and say, you know, we should, you should do things. And I say, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. And, you know, and we have an, a small enough group of investigators at the BRC that, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, there's a consensus. And the consensus was that we should be in the space. So we had worked out with Moderna in towards the end of 2019, a demonstration project where we would pick a virus and see how fast we could get in a clinic. And the virus we chose was NEPA, which is um, a paramyxovirus that Barney knew well. And so we thought we knew how to design it. And um, so we were actually planning on seeing if we could, from the day that we designed the sequence, if we get it to Moderna and get it in the clinic in two or three months. And that was the end of 2019. So literally when, uh, when SARS-2 came along, we just slotted it into that existing cloud. Wow. We were pretty fortunate, actually. Uh, uh, no, that's prescient. <laughs> uh, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, what strikes me about this is uh, <clears throat> it's like it's like the old Mark Twain qu quote that it, it takes three weeks to prepare a good impromptu speech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you know, it, it, yeah, you we were we were able to get these vaccines so fast because of twenty years of prior work leading up to and you know VRC starting the turn of the last uh, the turn of the century um, really was a big part of that. So, what was uh, your role and VRC's role in Operation Warp Speed? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll try to give a short answer to that. Um, <laughs> early on. Um, you know, I run a lab, which is my first love, but as director of the vaccine center, I often get involved in working with other parts of uh, health and human services like BARDA. So during the Ebola outbreak, where there were, you know, the 11,000 deaths, uh, really terrible outbreak in 2015, 16, and the, the Zika outbreak, we established uh, interagency working groups to try to take advantage of who should BARDA fund, because they have a lot of money, and how should NIH assist and bring forth the best science. So we had, when COVID came along, we formed an interagency working group with NIH and BARDA and CDC and started saying, hey, th this isn't business as usual. We need to be working at fast speed here. And then Peter Marks, who of course is at FDA, really came into the picture advising, you know, not sure exactly, you know, Peter took a role that he needed to take, which was outside the scope of FDA to say, we need to do something more formal here. And so he took that up to the senior leadership, you know, to Tony and the secretary and all. And, and I, the story is, and I think it's true, that you know, we wrote a memo and suggested it, and it was too mundane. You know, it gets up there to the levels of the higher ups of the health and human service, and they say, oh, an interagency working group, it sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter said, no, we're going we're gonna to give it a good name. And he, and he came up with the name Operation Warp Speed. And I do think it's correct if you ask Peter that he suggested that. And um, that kind of took, and but it, it, it lent the appropriate urgency to the situation. And then we heard nothing for some period of time. And I think the, the leadership really took it to heart and you know ended up forming Operation Warp Speed hiring. One thing that we talked some quite a bit about was um, if the US government was gonna do this, there needed to be some expertise within the government from the private sector because BARDA was likely needed to fund of companies to do advanced development very quickly. And people would look to me at the vaccine center and I would say, you know, I don't know very much about advanced development of vaccines, right? You talk to me about the structure function of an envelope like a protein, that's great, and phase one study. So, you know, there was a strong intent to bring in someone and eventually they brought in Monsef Slawi. So to make a long story short, um, a number of us at the VRC but just volunteered to work with that effort, lend our expertise. And even though I'm not an expert in clinical trials by nature, I think I was senior enough and knew enough about vaccines that I volunteered to take on a role as heading of the vaccine development team under Operation Warp Speed, which mainly worked with the companies on the government side to help oversee the clinical trials. And um, I, I brought in, since I didn't have expertise, brought in people with true clinical trials expertise uh, into that group, people who had been on data safety monitoring boards and stati biostatistical expertise. And it was really an enormously fun and um, intensive learning experience to, to be part of that. So it seems to me that a, a fundamental concept in Operation Warp Speed was to identify a manageable number of candidate vaccines spanning uh, a uh, a healthy variety of technologies, okay? 
uh, and you know, focus on those and move forward. So how did that concept arise and how did the candidates shake out? So just as you're suggesting, we had a couple things in mind. One was um, different candidates. So for example, representing different vaccine platforms. Early on, we right. had no idea that RNA would really work. We were enthusiastic about it from literally from phase one studies. Um, th we're, there was a strong sense that a protein vaccine platform should be in the mix. And I think there's quite a bit of experience even with Ebola on adenoviral platforms. So we had a sense that at least those three platforms, there was some discussion that one um, example of each platform is maybe not enough because things can readily fail. So that led to maybe two, um, two commercial players, for lack of a better word, in each platform. So we ended up there with the six, with two protein, two RNA, two adenovirus. And there's a lot of other discussions, should there be an inactivated whole virus in there? But there wasn't in the US a commercial entity that was uh, planning to develop okay. that. That's sort of how we ended up there. And live attenuated, same thinking? Same thinking. And it turns out it takes a long time to develop oh. live attenuated because you have to figure out if it's correctly attenuated. And then how were the specific uh, candidates uh, filtered out? So BARDA has a mechanism to do um, what they call tech watch and related um, uh, communications where private sector companies, whether they be a smaller biotech or a large pharma company, can come in and propose that they would do development. And eventually BARDA then puts out formal requests for proposals and does the funding. And usually BARDA is an independent entity separate from NIH, but under the context of Operation Warp Speed, the Operation Warp Speed group of people uh, led by Monsef Slawi and then General Pern at the time, really met as a senior group of people with subject matter experts advising and eventually picked the, the groups that ended up being chosen for funding. It's just, the, the whole thing to me is just astonishing because like you said, <laughs> interagency effort sounds awful. Uh, and, <laughs> but, but, and this is a massive project, but it worked, you know? It was unprecedented and no, it's, it's nice to hear people recognize that. I, I think it, it did work. It, I would emphasize that there were an enormous amount of people that most, you know, never hear of mm -hmm. at NIH and BARDA uh, and CDC. Um, a lot of people from the um, U.S. Military Medical Research Command, uh, for reasons that are somewhat arcane, the contracting capabilities of the Army tended to be somewhat more facile than, than all of that. So there were literally, I don't know, hundreds, but hundred, probably hundreds of of biomedical type people um, working on this uh, really closely together. I was I was interested in the. Uh, uh, I just lost it, so forget it. All. I, I wanted okay. to ask when you when you first started all this, did you have a timeline involved in mind? Did it was it a year or two or ten? What, what were you thinking? Yes, if one even looks at the very early Operation Warp Speed literature, the, getting a vaccine within a year uh -huh. was uh, was the goal. I think there was an intent even to distribute 300 million doses by early the next year, which we didn't quite meet because you remember the, the rollout of the vaccine wasn't so quick, but we came close to meeting the, the timeline. I know what it was. You talked about harmonizing the clinical trials, yes. uh, which, which fascinates me because I, you know, this never would have occurred to me that what the issues were, but as, as I understand it, one possible approach was to make, put all the clinical trials together so that you had one placebo group and all the other trials going on at the same time, or simply to harmonize them from the point of view is to set common standards uh, yes. and certain, certain procedures and goals that had to be met. But other than that, uh, and providing funding, let everybody go at it uh, on their own, and which turned out to be, I think rightfully, the more promising approach. Because getting everybody on the same boat is going to be tough and slow some people down. Well, thanks for recognizing that. Uh, it was a big debate. And okay. there, there were, um, I think, re reasons on both sides. And I had to learn a lot very fast and learn to, to talk to the senior leadership of the companies involved. But what I learned pretty quickly is that you, if one wants to move fast, you take a Pfizer, for example, who came in and partnered with BioNTech um, to, bring, to clinically develop a product. Pfizer's not going to be interested in a master protocol run by NIH. And what, at the end of the day, I learned from Peter Marks and others, Pfizer needs to be the sponsor of their own protocol, which means 
from the regulatory perspective, they're the ones who go to the FDA and ask for a emergency use authorization. In order to do that, they need to be control of the protocol and their data. So we had this, this uh, uh, sort of mixed system where the government could fund, we did for Moderna, for example, Pfizer funded their own trial, and we did for the other studies, but the company would remain the responsible entity to submit to the FDA. And that took a lot of work, but that's, and then in order to do that, we, we asked the companies and actually required them as part of the funding to uh, harmonize the design of the studies, which ended up not being so hard to do. So um, we talked a little bit earlier about kind of the genesis of the VRC. Um, yes. Do you think, um, or how would this have looked different if we didn't have a VRC um, when the pandemic emerged? Well, you know, that's a that's always a tough question. I think the, the RNA space was, you know, had a had a great legacy of a lot of public investment from DARPA and then companies like BioNTech and Pfizer that innovated. Um, so that was coming along well, although I do think public funding made an enormous uh, difference to RNA. But I do think that we we made a big impact in if 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 not for which the field would not have been nearly as close in the design. So Peter Kwong, you know, Jason McClellan trained with Peter Kwong and studied HIV. And then Jason and Barney and Peter designed a stabilized RSVF glycoprotein, which is still in clinical trials. And I like to think it will work. And it was, it was that, so it wasn't just at the VRC, there was that kind of a thinking that existed in the HIV field, existed at Scripps and Andrew Ward's lab and Jason McClellan's lab, but, but all of it was all of us working together. And I think Without that, I don't think we would have been nearly as close on the getting the design, the antigen design right. Do you do you see uh, any additional vaccines being EUA licensed in the U.S. now at this point? The, the ones that are still pending um, are the two proteins that have taken much longer than we hoped, mm-hmm. Novavax and Sanofi. And I think those yeah. are both possible. Um, and um, AstraZeneca may not need to you know, um, make an application in the U.S. because they, they have uh, authorization out elsewhere. So in the short term, I think it's just the two proteins. Okay. Which could be beneficial, um, for example, in children or certain populations where the proteins are traditionally used. Yeah, maybe it will overcome some hesitancy towards some of the what called so-called, you know, different vaccines, mRNAs and vectors that... I don't know if that's the case or not. We certainly have enough of the other vaccines to have, get everyone right, but not everyone wants to take them. Right. I think your guess is as good as mine. You hope so, right? Yeah, one hopes. Right. You, right. What, so what have you been thinking about as the variants have emerged? Have, for each one, have you started thinking about a new vaccine and then moved on? What, what's your thinking there? Yeah, my first thought is that the virus has Molecular evolution, or whatever one want to call it, I think you know. I, I've listened to your discussions with you. I appreciate very much. You know, the, the, the selection for fitness mm-hmm. occurs at, at a pace that's much greater and faster than I would have imagined. Yeah. And I think yeah. once you know, it, we, you remember the beginning where there was just D six fourteen G. Yes, of course. And I said that I said, okay, well, you know, and it, you know, some really smart people were saying it's replacing everything. I said, okay, well, it's an amino acid, right? And then alpha yeah. comes along, and then beta comes along. After a while, you say, okay. I'm not skeptical anymore. And then Delta comes along and essentially does have some new biology to it. Well, however you describe transmissibility, it certainly took over. And then um, Omicron comes out of nowhere, right? I think most people, me included, would have expected further antigenic evolution along the Delta lineage. That could in and of itself been a pretty, been a pretty major problem. And then you get something that comes almost out of left field. Um, so, I think it's it, it, it's dauntingly unpredictable, but with regard to you know the current data to me are yet to tell us what to do about Omicron. It's not clear that given the fact that we immunized people with the prototype strain, that a Delta boost would be better. If, if there were human data to suggest that, I mean, even simple immunogenicity data to show that you broaden better the immune response with Delta than with, proto- well, I'm sorry, with Omicron than prototype, fine. But I'm not sure that that's the case. And I don't, I don't actually, it's hard to predict what the answer will be. So what oh. do you think of Pfizer's um, ongoing effort? I mean, they've got an Omicron vaccine candidate that they're now 
planning to take into, into the clinic? Yeah, I certainly think it's the right approach to, ge to generate the data. And I, Moderna has indicated publicly that they're making an Omicron-based RNA also. I've been intrigued to see the data. I looked at the Pfizer press release, which I think just came out this morning. Yeah. They're going to also try to do, they're going to find naive people and do an Omicron-only arm, if, which I think would be intriguing. I mean, maybe not realistic, right? There's not that many people right. left. But wouldn't it be interesting to know the, you know, the, the lineages that you elicit starting with Omicron versus right. boosting yeah. with Omicron. So I, I think the study is, is scientifically valuable. But, but it actually brings up a major hurdle at this point because so much of the world, I mean, the majority of the world has either been vaccinated or infected at this point, probably. Um, so your, your placebo group, well, okay, are you going to take only <laughs> people who are completely immuno naive and how much smaller is that going to make your study population? It, it seems like these are just going to get progressively harder and harder to do studies on, right? I think it's an enormously difficult logistic challenge, um, so, so, which I think makes it a pretty high bar to change the strain. But certainly, if you know, and I think it's a combination of, of course, of the clinical data that we get a lot of really nice real world efficacy data pretty quickly nowadays from various places from Dakar and Canada and UK and, and even now the CDC is pretty quickly. And if we were to see, you know, that efficacy weren't, well, you know, after six months or eight months uh, against Omicron wasn't good in, in preventing serum, severe infection, we might want to rethink it. And if studies of Omicron boosters showed that the immunogenicity were preferable, maybe you could build a case. So the original, uh, Efficacy was measured for these vaccines is measured as efficacy against symptomatic disease, and which can be then subcategorized subcategorized as serious infections or hospitalizations or deaths. And my sense, at least, with um, Omicron is that uh, in terms of uh, the the existing vaccines against the ancestral strains are as efficacious against serious disease or hospitalization or death, but my sense is that they are not as efficacious against symptomatic disease. Is there data to support that perspective? Is that what's going on? Or are we in the process of collecting those data or what? I think that's what the data now show. Even the um, CDC data that was released mm -hmm. in the MMWR just a couple of days ago, one of the cohorts, um, I think I, I have in here, because I always forget, there's a cohort called Vision, and I'm going to call Ivy. I printed them out because, again, you know, I, I'm not really an expert in interpreting real world evidence studies. But, you know, you, you, as you all do, you know, you, you, you review them and you get you get a certain amount of expertise in interpreting the odds ratios and, and all of that. But um, the data from the recent MMWR publications really clearly show that, against symptomatic disease, uh, if you look out six months after two doses of RNA, it was going below 50 percent against okay. symptomatic disease. Sym so all symptomatic, not just severe but all symptomatic yeah. yeah all symptomatic yeah okay but severe is still maintained at a high level right it, it is although in one of the mmwrs just from a couple of days ago it was dropping they so they had two categories i remember one was emergency or urgent care visits which mm -hmm. i think you can interpret as a pretty bad case of symptomatic bad enough to get you to see the doctor and they had hospitalizations and it was a really nice table to look at um and it showed that with omicron if you looked at uh, emergency visits or even hospitalizations, you were starting to get um, a clearly statistically significant measurable decline. So it would go from 90 to 75 or something, mm -hmm. even there. And then it would go back up with a third dose. Right. And this Sounds is like a, a paper we need to do, Vincent. Uh, yes. Yeah. This, um, <laughs> yeah. da da Daniel may have mentioned it, but these are all, these are in vaccinated people, right? That's the point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Uh, so, Rich mentioned uh, that the vaccine trials were meant to look at uh, symptomatic infection or symptomatic disease, sorry. Um, and, you know, many people are up in arms about the fact that the vaccines are not always protecting against infection and that we are getting <laughs> these breakthrough infections. Um, how different, if at all, do we think this is um, compared to other vaccines? Or is this just that we're looking the first time? <laughs> I think it's mainly that we're looking for the first time. And I agree with, you know, much of the discussion I've heard on, you know, in this podcast, you know, if we had looked for PCR um, mm -hmm. detection of the measles virus, 
<laughs> I don't know if anybody's done it, but I imagine you'd find it pretty often. So it is unfortunate, yeah. you, know, that, you know, it's just, it's the reality that the public has become interested in vaccinology and immunology. Uh, but yes, the, the primary endpoint of the first phase three studies was symptomatic COVID and a, a subset or a secondary endpoint were very specific definitions of severe COVID. Um, so those were all built into the studies. And not only were the, this was part of the harmonization, we required that the cases be followed to determine if they became serious. Mm-hmm. Because it would be easy just to sell your case and forget about it. But um, we required that the case reports followed them closely, took oxygen saturations, clinical data, so we could see symptomatic cases and serious cases. Um, so in your, go sorry, ahead. Vincent, go ahead. Well, in, in your article, you talk, you spend some time talking about safety and adverse effects. And you raise the uh, innovation of vSafe. Okay. So this is this uh, app. And ironically, I just got pinged by vSafe uh, as we're talking. They want my latest report. So this was an app that people could, or a website that people could uh, register for after getting their vaccine. Uh, that will ping them occasionally and ask how they're doing, okay? Uh, and I'm interested in your comments on uh, how successful that has been. And I'm also interested in whether or not and what degree that's uh, integrated with the vaccine adverse effects reporting system. You know, this is an area where I'd say um, my expertise is less than most, Um what I can say is that you know, the vSafe is one of several avenues that the FDA and the CDC use. And as people have pointed out, vSafe is a passive system yeah. where almost any information can be input. So it's, in a sense, maybe a sentinel warning system. And one of the things that both, I think, the FDA and CDC have done is that you know, one isn't necessarily prepared to monitor real-time safety in a pandemic. So they had to upgrade that system and other surveillance systems to be able to take in real-time data and vet that, if you think about how you would vet the data to know if there really is an adverse event and to have different um, clinical sort of, um, uh, you know, surveillance groups other than vSafe, where you have hospital-based systems and other systems who are catching cases and adverse events and really documenting them. So they, it took a lot of time and effort for both those organizations to upgrade the ability to monitor adverse events. Do you, um, so we're, the U.S. is at 63% fully vaccinated. Do you, do you think we can do better? And, I mean, there are an awful lot of people who, who view these vaccines as experimental, and they, <laughs> which is absurd, but that's their, that's their mantra. What, what, can, yeah. what can we do, and do you think we will improve it, or are we stuck there? I've become less optimistic. Earlier on, I was mm-hmm. looking at the number of people. 2020 did that to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. You know, if you look at the age over 65, and it, it, you know, I think the numbers are hard to be fully accurate, but it's something like well over 90 and sometimes 95% of people have received at least one vaccine. Yeah. So 95% of any group is an enormous number. And certainly people aged over 65 have all kinds of different views in life. So it, I think it tells you something about human nature, which is that if you really perceive a risk, mm. I think people, you know, maybe when you're over 65, you you have a bit better sense of, of you know, the, the time of life and risk. So I used to, th- my initial thought was optimistic that that would translate down over time. But I have to say it hasn't, right? I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think it has. Yeah, I saw, uh, there was a rally yesterday in D.C., as you probably know, and I saw a clip of a guy saying, I'm not anti-vax, I got all the other vaccines, I don't want this one, it's, it's experimental. But it's not. And how do we get that message out? And I mean, it's being warped by certain prominent anti-vax people, right? Pfizer is a fully licensed vaccine. Yeah. Um, I think Moderna's application is pending and at some point will be. And I think it's a slow process of education. Yeah. Do you have any uh, numbers about population level seropositivity, vaccine induced or infection induced uh, uh, in, the, in the U.S.? I'm wondering if we're approaching, you know, the 90% uh, exposure number. It's a hard number to get. I've been on some discussions where the CDC are trying to really get a sense of that. And, you know, don't quote me accurately on this. I, I think the discussions has been centered around something like 80% if you combine vaccination and, and infection. Okay. Um, 
That's enough. That's enough room for another wave. Oh yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it's a lot of people. Well, especially if you have a variant that can evade some of that yeah. immunity. Perhaps it goes higher after the Omicron wave. We'll see. Yeah. So, do we now have um, a good experience for the next pandemic, whatever it is, to be able to quickly make vaccines? I, I wouldn't say that we do. Mm. One of the interesting mm. aspects of COVID was that in, in retrospect, we turned out to be pretty well prepared, as we discussed. mRNA had just come along, and we knew a lot about the spike protein of coronaviruses and, and the fact that it's preferable to stabilize it. So if one asks, are we there for other viruses? I think it varies by virus, but, and again, this is something that Barney Graham really led our thinking in. He and colleagues coins the term that we often use now, uh, prototype pathogens, hmm. where for coronavirus, MERS was really a prototype for the family. And it, it turned out, and it may not be so simple, right, for every virus family, that one could pretty directly translate from MERS to SARS-2 with regard to antigen design and even the platform. Um, so the thinking is that we should invest in a fairly intensive way to fill in the knowledge gaps, scientific virologic knowledge gaps, immunologic gaps, structure of viral glycoproteins, immune correlates of protection, what it takes to protect, as well as clinical development of candidates in the space of each virus family. I don't think we're naive enough to think that one prototype for, you know, every virus family is enough, but if you get smart virologists and vaccinologists thinking about it, the idea would be to know as much as you can all the way through the phase one development of some candidates in each virus family to be as prepared as you can. And what can rank order to some degree? You know, do we think that a paramyxovirus like Nipah or something from influenza or another coronavirus or, you know, where would you put your, your bets? One can make those priorities and, and invest sort of in a tiered way. Do you think there are any specific uh, virologic or immunologic questions that we really need to move forward on answering uh, to make that work better? We we started to do a sort of huge matrix of virus families here at NIH and look where you know where the gaps are. The gaps vary. There are virus families. I mean, in the Bunyavir viridae, which is pretty diverse, you know, um, where we don't know much about structures or function or correlates of immunity. And there are other places where we know more, but we've never developed a vaccine candidate. So I think there's, there's a lot. And I think the other side of that coin is there's a lot of talk about virologic surveillance, which I don't think we do very well. And I think some of our colleagues here, Danny Dewick and colleagues uh, and, and Adrian McDermott here have talked about immunologic surveillance. Do we really know how the immune system, what the immune system has seen uh, on a population basis? And can we pair those two and, and have a better sense of what might emerge in addition to being prepared on the other end. Well, it, yeah, well there's also uh, there's also an issue of um, needing to, to build some kind of sustainable structures um, as we as we look, you know, 10, 20 years from now. I mean, the, your institute is obviously a great example of something that was there already that could be called into use. Um, but it was there already for other reasons. And that's the kind of thing that we hope we would have when the next pandemic comes along. But if the next pandemic isn't for another 20 years, how do you, what, what sorts of things do you try to put in place to ensure that that doesn't go to the next round of budget cuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one. There has been um, a recognition of this problem and it's even been, um, sort of codified in some pretty prominent reports. CEPI, I think you guys know the CEPI organization that Richard Hatchett runs, has written a lot about this in a very productive way about having to, to invest sustainably. There was something called the Apollo Report from the US government, which also talked about pandemic preparedness. But what remains to be done is really the investment in a sustainable way. So there's a recognition, which is a first step. I think part of what's happened is that the COVID pandemic has remained in such a way that it's, it's kind of taken over our tension. And until that's in a bit better place, it's hard for the funders in the world to think about being prepared for something else. This to me gets into a, a concept that you raised in your article as well, uh, of surge capacity, yes. okay? Which I had not really thought about this before, but it's like, 
you know, you, you want to be ready. Okay. Uh, and, and ready is not just the science, but it's all the technology uh, and the manufacturing and everything else, but you can't like build all this capacity and then just let it sit there for 20 years. Okay. okay. It's like, you have to have a plan to make use of this stuff, but also in a fashion where when the time comes, you can shift that usage to accommodate the surge uh, that comes with a pandemic. Seems to me like a huge problem. It is. It's, it, it's feasible if people are thoughtful and intent about it. One can build <laughs> clinical research capacity in various regions of the world where um, they can be doing immunosurveillance, immunologic surveillance, doing phase one studies of prototype vaccines, and can, it, keeping the scientific basis of the infrastructure going. I mean, it's not, it's not simple. But I think it's possible to do if there's a real intent to do it. Well, and I think there are there are models from other spheres of activity that kind of suggest. Um, I'm thinking volunteer fire departments, right? If a small town can't afford to have a dedicated fire department, but they obviously need one. So what do you do? Well, you train up a bunch of volunteers, and they train occasionally, and you maintain that. They go and do their regular jobs, and then when there's a fire, you call them in. And they do their thing, or or the military reserves and and national guard type of system, where you can you can call up a much bigger force, but most of the time they're kind of off doing their own thing. And, and people have applied that to sort of talk about regional capacity. Yes. It's it's not ideal to just have big pharma develop and be responsible for worldwide distribution when it it, it should be possible to have scientific and clinical and manufacturing capacity regionally that we, you know, not a simple um, item, but there is a lot of discussion now, uh, for example, on low and middle income countries having um, regional mRNA or other vaccine manufacturing capability. Well, Which and, could and have I, a lot of other advantages on a day-to-day -day basis that might be able to justify its maintenance and, you know, for, for 20, 30 year time periods. Yeah, exactly. I'm sort of struck by some of the comments you made at the very beginning about the fact that, you know, there was this idea of trying to do the NEPA platform or to apply, see how, just trying to see how you could quickly commercialize. And so you had that ready and you could pivot, although I will admit this pandemic has made me hate the word pivot. <laughs> <laughs> you could sort of pivot into using that for this pandemic. And so I wonder if there couldn't be something somewhat similar of let's work on some improvements in influenza vaccines or improvements in other vaccines. And as we need to pivot that for a pandemic, if that could work similarly. Uh, yeah, I agree 100 percent. I mean, influenza is a great example. It, it seems to me there's a lot of research and development for improvements in influenza vaccines. And it's not simple, but we've learned so much about immunity and vaccine platforms, um, structure based vaccine design that we should be able to, I think, improve influenza vaccines. One would hope uh, because we'll certainly have a flu pandemic at some point. Right. Right. Um, but uh, what is the efficacy or effectiveness? 60% at best, right? Right. I, I assume mRNA influenza vaccines are in, in being tested, right? They are. There's several in development. Uh, I, there was at least one published by Moderna. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a work in progress to figure out how to best use RNA and how to best encode hemagglutinin and whether you should encode several hemagglutinins and how to, you know, how to get broader immunity, more durable immunity, and all those things that plague uh, influenza vaccines. You, yeah, mentioned the R you mentioned an RSV vaccine. Uh, I'm not familiar with what, what your, what the, what's the platform and what's the status? Uh, the, the most developed platform is protein, and it's a stabilized form of the RSV uh, fusion protein. And it's, again, work from Peter Kwong and Jason McClellan and Barney Grimm, where the uh, RSV is pretty famous for the fact that um, you know, all fusion proteins are somewhat metastable because they have to fuse and change their shape. And in RSV, if, you know, if one looks at the virus, you can see pre-fusion you know, native uh, F, and one can see post-fusion F. It's sort of so metastable that it, it uh, fully transitions. And so the insight that Barney and colleagues had was that one needs to stabilize the F protein in its native configuration, which is really what antibodies need to see. So they did that by uh, in, in a product that has um, some stabilizing disulfides and some um, 
hydrophobic amino acid interactions that hold the native trimer together. So that has been being developed by GSK. And then Pfizer made its own form of a stabilized uh, native F. So both companies are in advanced phase three trials okay. for, uh, for a RSV vaccine for which, you know, the field has been trying for over 30 years or more to, to develop. Great. Uh, last thing I want to ask you, John, I assume your name is uh, of Italian origin, right? It is. What, um, uh, what generation are you? Um, on my mother's side, my mother's first generation and my father was yeah. second, uh, at least on my mother's side, she grew up in a fully Sicilian uh, family speaking Sicilian. And my <laughs> grandmother spoke broken English till, till the day that she, she passed late into her nineties. So, and, and in fact, I'm married to an Italian girl just, you know, for, I don't know, maybe that was by design. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a strong Italian heritage along with a waning Boston accent. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. John Miscola, Director of Vaccine Research Center. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Do you guys that was know? Great. Very that was good excellent. stuff. Yep. Yeah. You notice that Zoom has changed the video arrangement? They put little black bars in between. Do you notice? I had I had noticed a difference. I had not. Well, you notice I mean, each of you now were four. Oh but yeah, yeah. So yeah. when I go to Brady Bunch view, I see the the borders have changed. Yeah, they used to be right up against each other, and now they have yeah. rounded, round made rounded, rounded rectangles and um, yeah. put little black. I assume lines. that's a, it's a ZenCaster where you can get you make people pop in as yeah. they're introduced. I do. And then you can yes. fit you can fit an odd number of people. Yeah. On a rectangular screen, that's awesome. I yeah. yeah, so I get individual videos on Zencaster, so um, I can arrange them. And I usually put a little border in between. I kind of like the spacing. And now mm -hmm. Zoom has done it because last week with Alessandro, we didn't. They were squished together, so Zoom has yeah, made Zoom a little. Zoom probably noticed you were switching back. And oh forth yeah, I'm sure they did. <laughs> yes, it's totally what happened. Yeah, I've, I debated using uh, Zencaster today, but I. I just wasn't sure. I mean, Zoom uh, understood that during the pandemic, a lot of people had boundary issues. Yeah, so boundary I issues. Oh, That's I, it. I mean, uh, uh, Udell had no problem with uh, Zencaster, so I'm using it more and more for guests. I'm just afraid that people are so used to Zoom that they just want to yeah. use it. But for me, it's much, for production, it's much better to have individual files. But sure. this should be fine. His sound was very good. His picture is very good. So well, yeah. that was uh, that was extraordinarily informative, and that article is uh, really great. It's great pre Omicron, yes. but it's still really great. Yeah, yeah. Great article, great info. I got, learned some little nuggets of the vaccine yeah. literature. I want to go spend some time reading on. Yeah, and I, you know, I thought the vaccine research center was a good idea when they did it, but um, I, I, you know, in retrospect, it was all done perfectly, right? It yeah, sounds great. Yeah. That story that they already had in mind, they were having they were uh, thinking of drills. Doing yeah, that's yes. good. Mm -hmm. They were doing drills. That's that's awesome. It's perfect. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing you get. I mean, as as pointed out, that's the kind of thing that you get when you've got this type of an effort that's sustaining itself and doing these types of, of what if experiments. Um and uh, oh, by the way, we got a real pandemic. Okay. Well, you know, ring the fire bell and let's this is not a drill. This is not a drill, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but the idea that you do some research that a company's not going to do, but what you need is perfect, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. the perfect yeah. solution. Let's do a couple of emails here. I, I'm going to take this first one. It has to do with me. Paula writes, coyote and deer. Oh, yes, they will prey quite easily on even mature white-tailed bucks, although they can't take them down as quickly as a pack of wolves, of course. But there are so many more coyotes. So I guess we talked about yeah. coyotes don't yeah. take down deer. Okay. And uh, Paula sends a video. They will go after them like an ermine attacks a rabbit until they are too exhausted and succumb. Paula in Minnesota. I have done a lot of bow hunting myself. And then um, uh, Kathy put in a comment. Comment to Vincent from a listener who wrote to Kathy. He was lucky with the one trapped on the fence in his backyard. Mary writes, he's incredibly fortunate that he survived that experience. <laughs> My favorite animal vets, including one who specializes in wildlife, have lectured me over the years about the extreme hazard to humans and their dogs from wild deer. My own experiences bear out their warnings. The Bambi face is totally misleading. 
Deer hooves are like razor knives driven by a pneumatic hammer, and they will employ them without hesitation. I hope Vincent never, should he happen to have a deer catch its foot in his fence again, tries to take a nasal swab from a deer. I was just joking. I was never going to take yeah. a nasal swab. <laughs> I w they had a fence between us. The deer was on the other side, and so I had there was no danger. The, the deer's foot was caught. It was totally <laughs> lying there. And then even when I released the foot, it it didn't move for a while because I think the leg was you know paralyzed yeah. uh, and then it ran off of course which is the first thing they're not going to attack you so yeah. I wasn't going to take a nasal swab I was just joking but thank you for the <laughs> for the, and the, uh, the coyote conversation um, so when we were talking about that the the point that I thought was relevant is um, yeah co coyote will take down <clears throat> large animals including adult deer and, and even, even large bucks. Um, but they just don't do it at a frequency that will keep the deer population down, right. which Got is it. why the entire Northeastern United States is infested with coyotes and still infested with deer. They're just yes. not doing the job. Yes. I, I think that this came up because we were talking about the, the positivity of yes. SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS and white-tailed deer. Yeah, and we were sure. wondering what other organisms might be yeah. infected as a result. Yeah. And I made a joke saying I, I should yeah. have taken a nasal swab, but I would never right. have done it. No. Uh, no. Um, so we now have foxes all over the place, right? I've, I, five years ago, I never saw a single fox in the neighborhood. <laughs> and now they're always running around. And the other morning, uh, we were looking in the woods. My son says, there are two foxes there and they're eyeing a deer that's right next to them. So we were wondering if they were going to gang up. I mean, foxes are pretty small. Foxes are- They're small. Yeah. But and, he said, you know- mostly well, hunt alone. I mean, one of them could like slash its leg and then they could trail it for days until it- yeah. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so he went out and looked at the foxes and they ran away. So they left the deer alone. You you probably have plenty of bunnies and squirrels for the foxes to eat that they don't have to. Oh yeah, if I'm deer. squirrels, uh, bunnies, yeah. chipmunks, snakes, yeah. whatever. We, yeah, we have we, that here. That's that's what killed my garden. I made a futile attempt at a garden in the back corner of our heavily wooded lot, and it was too shady. But half the plants that came up were eaten down to the nubs immediately. Well, you have Just, to. Yeah, we have s severe fences, and we have raised beds that they can't get over. But we okay. have substantial fences and we made raised beds and on the bottom is chicken wire so they can't oh, dig so they can't dig up to get right. in so uh they don't they don't get in so we've had good luck with garden the past few years brian can you take the next one sure sue ellen writes i've been listening for a long time way back before covid almost to the very beginning of twiv i also listen to all the other twix podcasts Today, there is an article in the New York Times by Jeff Shaman, and whenever I see an article or editorial by someone who's been on TWIV or one of your other podcasts, I find myself reading it because somehow I feel I know the writer, and I know that if they have been on your podcast, they are writing something that's worth reading. Same with TV. If Dr. Daniel is on the news, or Peter Hotez, or of course, Dr. Fauci, I find myself paying more attention because I trust that person. And I trust that person because he or she has been on your podcast. I don't even know if you realize that you are having this effect on your listeners. A lot of us are not scientists, and we are flooded with talking heads who want us to think one way or another about COVID, vaccines, global warming, and global warming, et cetera. It is hard to know who to trust, but I have found that I immediately trust anyone who's been on your podcast, not just because I trust you all to bring us only the best scientists, but also because I've had a firsthand experience of hearing that person talk about his or her science. Just another reason to pat yourselves on the back for a job very well done. Keep podcasting. You are making a difference. Um, and Sue Ellen is in uh, Roswell, Georgia, where it's winter again for a few days, uh, 40 Fahrenheit today, going up to only 48, but next week it's back in the 60s. Cool, yeah. I, I, we do, uh, we vet for you, okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 she makes an interesting point. I hadn't thought of it that way, and that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, well, these people have been on, and and even Peter Hotez, actually he's been on yeah. uh, TWIP, I think, not TWIV, yeah. No, Peter no, Hotez was on Twitter. Has he been? Yeah. Yeah. When? That was, um, 
It would have been. Oh, it was during last, the pandemic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. this, not this past November, but the okay. November before December, early December, maybe something like that. I mean, we are not responsible what people say once they get off TWIV, okay? <laughs> right, right. We don't. <laughs> I don't think we've had anybody on TWIV who went on to say anything really bad, have we? No, not bad, just maybe not correct or. Yeah, they may, you know. they may. Yeah. So <laughs> we, Peter we do not endorse the opinions of our guests. Peter Hotez has been on twice on oh, TWIV. Huh. Um, he was on episode 687. Uh, in November of 2020, and he was also on a special episode where he talked about his book. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. Vaccines did not cause Rachel's autism. Right. And he was on an early twip a long time ago. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Saskia writes, Dear Twivers, in the latest issue of the German podcast, Das Coronavirus Update, Christian Drosten discusses, amongst many other things, the following preprint on MedArchive, provides a link. Um, SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant of concern transmission in Danish households. And this is by Linksa et al. Um, senior author is Kirkaby. I would love to hear your opinion on this. Christian Drosten, Drosten linked this preprint and discussed it in a lot of detail. Uh, in the abstract, the authors write, uh, quote, our findings confirm that the rapid spread of the Omicron variant of concern primarily can be ascribed to the immune evasiveness rather than an inherent increase in the basic transmissibility. This is what you Twivers sa have said since Omicron popped up. Thank you so much for the great work. I listened to all of the Twix podcasts since spring 2020, and as many of li your listeners write, it feels as if I know you all. I hope Vincent can come to Zurich this year since he couldn't come in 2021. I would love to listen to his lecture live and in person. Best wishes for 2022 to you all, Alan, Amy, Brianne, Dixon, Kathy, Rich, and Vincent. Saskia, P.S. The pandemic situation in Switzerland is not very good. Only 69% of the total population are vaccinated with at least one dose, 76% of age 12 plus, 90% of age 65 plus. And you can find the status report for Switzerland and Liechtenstein and provides a link. And Saskia is in Zurich. Well, thank you, Saskia. Great. And I think we're we're at sixty three percent in the U.S. Right? So yeah, yeah. The Swiss are doing better. And we did this paper on Saskia on eight five four. So good. Okay. I'm sure you've heard it already. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I plan to go to Zurich in May. They have a. a, a that's when I'm, they asked me to go talk, and um, I'll be there. Great. Be there. Be square. Rich, you're next. Stephen writes, Dear Twiv team, listening to uh, yesterday's episode 851, there was some discussion of the failure of the two-dose regimen in children two to five years old. Amy said that two doses did not produce any antibodies. However, this is not what Pfizer reported. Their press release says that, compare, says that quote, compared to the 16 to 25-year-old population in which high efficacy was demonstrated, non-inferiority was met for the six to 24 month old population, but not for the two to five year old population in this analysis. That means as far as I can tell that for two to five years old year olds, antibody levels were not as high as for the 16 to 25 uh, year olds. Uh, some levels of antibodies were produced, maybe even enough to offer some protection, uh, but not as much. What I find really interesting is that for six to 24 months, the antibodies are at similar levels for 16 to 25 year olds. So two doses would probably be enough for them. It really makes me wonder though, if two doses at a slightly higher level would be enough to two to five year olds to produce uh, non-inferior levels of antibodies. The current dose is one tenth of the adult dose, though perhaps that study would take a longer time to set up. Thanks. Stephen, and he links to the press release from Pfizer uh, that uh, from which those quotes come and with comments on their uh, uh, ongoing studies. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah. you know, not straightforward. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, you know, tinkering with um, all these doses to try and find the right thing in a difficult situation, you know, because 
they uh, they want to uh, do this as uh, quickly as possible, but safely as well. In an environment where you're trying to judge efficacy by antibodies, um, which we have discussed at length, may or may not be an appropriate correlate protection. It's a tricky, tricky problem. Do you, do you know how they arrived at the dose for this age group? I do not know. Uh, I, I assume that, you know, it it is based on, uh, you know, dose escalation studies in other populations that they've done in the past, yeah. uh, combined with a lot of experience on uh, the uh, efficacy of uh, and the impact of various other vaccines in a pediatric population. But right. I'm totally making that up. And, yeah. and I, I think that they also looked at um, sort of risk levels as well mm -hmm. um, and sort of where the cutoff seemed to be for myocarditis mm. in this level in this age group. Yeah, one of the points they make in this press release is that they it, it, it reads as if they'd rather try a third dose at a low dose rather than up the dose. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. they know they've got safety at the low dose and maybe they can up the efficacy by yeah. giving a third dose rather than go to a higher dose. That makes sense to me. It, it makes sense to me, although and it's faster for them to complete a trial than having to start again at the beginning. Yeah. And re-enroll um, an entirely new population. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it might be faster for later vaccinees to get two higher doses. Mm. Uh, so right. I, I thought about it kind of both ways. Although in the, in the broader context, I think what we're arriving at ultimately is that these are going to be considered three-dose vaccines. Yeah. Yep. Yes. What we're calling a booster dose is just going to be called the third dose. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, JP writes, greetings, Vincent and TWIV folk. After hearing your pick regarding the secret of life at the end of the most recent TWIV, this favorite photo of myself <laughs> sprung to mind, though I did my PhD in London at the now defunct Imperial Cancer Research Fund. I only learned Rosalind Franklin was buried in North London decades later. At my last visit after a conference at the University of Reading, I made the pilgrimage to the Willisden Jewish Cemetery to visit Rosalind's grave. The workers there forbade any photographs out of adherence to Jewish law, respect for the dead. But when one found out I had traveled all the way from the States, he offered to take photos of me. Here I'm placing a stone from the MIT campus on her grave in tribute to her and Nancy Hopkins, from whom I took an introductory lab class in phage genetics. In college, when I studied the story of the discovery of the structure of DNA in a history of science class, I learned of Rosalind Franklin and harboring the limited capacity only a naive and stupid teenager could possess, though I thought her story was a sad one. It was only there at her gravesite with the perspective of middle age that the enormity of the tragedy of her early death fully came down on me, only 37 years old when she passed. It's probably sacrilege, but the notion crossed my mind of how interesting it might be to test her remains for BRCA1-2 as a way of completing the circle. She helped initiate the revolution of genetic medicine. Wouldn't it be fitting if medicine could determine her ovarian cancer had a genetic basis? And so uh, JP sends a picture of him putting st a stone on her yep. grave. Oh, look at that. Cool. cool. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. Brianne. Bethany writes, hello all. Thank you for making all of this education so much fun. I'm writing because I have depended on rapid tests quite a bit to decide whether or not to visit with family. I do not engage in a lot of high-risk activities, but I have visited family after air travel and tested daily for antigens during my stay out of caution. I was under the impression that I would be most likely to test positive through a rapid test, uh, for example, by next now, when I was most contagious. Recently, however, I have been hearing stories of people who don't test positive for antigens until they are symptomatic. I also understand that people tend to be most contagious pre-symptom onset. This worries me because it sounds like people aren't testing positive for antigens until they are past a period when they are potentially very contagious. Am I missing something? Is this new to the Omicron variant? I would appreciate any insight you can offer. Gratefully yours, Bethany. Um, so Bethany, I'm not sure of, um, all sorts of completely well done studies on this. Um, I've heard similar anecdotes to those that you mentioned here, um, but I'm not sure if all of the data are, um, available on this. Yeah. I, I think Daniel has mentioned this idea that if for Delta, as well as Omicron, you're shedding earlier perhaps, and that may be part of the 
spread, but we don't, I think the data are not in yet. Yeah. Anyone else have any insight? Uh, was this, was it Fauci's um, uh, phrase, data free zone? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I go back to I go back to the our earliest discussions of this, yeah. where there was a correlation between uh, virus load in quotes as measured by genome copies or uh, RNA copies, mm. not necessarily even genome RNA copies measured by PCR on the one hand, uh, and uh, antigen test positivity slash contagiousness on the other hand. Where, you know, we came to the conclusion that um, the antigen test might be the best uh, assessment of, of whether or yeah. not you're actually contagious. And I don't know of any new data that would uh, uh, indicate otherwise. Okay. But maybe it's out there. I don't know. Yeah. With the same asterisk that I'm not aware of any. <clears throat> To any actual data on this. Um, so we're just kind of blowing smoke yeah. here. But I, I mean, I think I think that there is data that the Omicron curves might look a little different. Might look a little I different. But I don't yes. think that there's data on how that is actually relating back to antigen tests. To, yeah. And to antigen tests versus infectivity versus right. <clears throat> genome copies. But the 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 one thing that I would cling to is that the antigen test is looking at the thing that you care about. Right. So it's detecting virus, not necessarily infectious virus, but it's detecting the antigens on the virus. So it's it's a step past looking at the RNA. Um, if you are negative on that, then it indicates there's not enough viral antigen to trip the test, which means if you are contagious, you're probably not super contagious. Um, maybe. <laughs> One of the things that's happening it seems to me, and this again is sort of anecdotal. This comes out of my experience. Uh, but it seems to me that in a lot of organizations, uh, the what they're asking you is, do you have symptoms? Yes. Okay, this is a recognition that not everybody's going to get a PCR test. And if they're PCR positive, they aren't necessarily contagious. Yeah. And they aren't testing everybody for antigen. So, for example... Uh, in uh, my grandson's uh, elementary school, K through five, uh, they uh, I, they don't assume everything is okay, but they you're you're fine in school uh, up until the point where you have symptoms. And you if if you go to the the nurse and you want to test, the nurse will say, "Do you have symptoms?" Yeah, because they don't have tests for everybody. They got enough to test you if you had symptoms. And if you got symptoms and you uh, test positive on an antigen test, you go home. So that probably doesn't get everybody, okay? But it gets some of them. And, you know, they're cooking up uh, a dozen cases a day, easy, in a, in a, in a school of, uh, of a thousand kids. And the kids go home, they spend a week home with a cold, and then they test negative, and then they go back to school. And it's a new uh, realm if you're vaccinated. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that that sort of behavior may play into this new impression of what's going on. Okay. Also, I like to think that maybe people are coming onto the same page that I am with. We need to start worrying. We need to be worrying less about cases and more about yes. um, serious outcomes. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Um, yeah. And Massachusetts just recently took an important step in this direction where they are now finally distinguishing in their data, uh, you know, in their hospitalization data, people who are in the hospital for COVID-19 versus people who are in the hospital who happen to have tested positive for COVID-19 because the hospitals are testing everybody. And it turns out that the, uh, the answer is 50%. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so in their hospitalization numbers, half the people who are listed as hospitalized with COVID-19 are there for other reasons. <clears throat> hmm. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Because we're talking yeah, about- Yeah, I mean, uh, so, so that, that kind of indicates that maybe we should be focusing the testing on people who are coming to medical attention yeah, for yeah. that instead of just testing everybody when there's no obvious reason to I, when they're not symptomatic. I wonder how that plays into the idea of- you know, vaccination preventing hospitalization. If people get hospitalized, they're vaccinated, but it's actually not for COVID. Does that? Yes. 
Kid. Right. Well, that was actually one of the reasons they did it because yeah. <clears throat> there was a lot of discussion. Oh, look at all these vaccinated people who are hospitalized mm -hmm. with COVID-19. Well, uh, half of them are hospitalized for reasons yeah. other than yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think you'd still want to do some of that testing, however, because I think that might change how you'd manage the patients. It, for example, would still, they get yes. a roommate? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you may you yeah. may still be concerned in many patient populations about that. So it's not necessarily true that the hospitals should be ending their testing programs. But I think for people who have not come to medical attention, there should be a question of how do you feel? Um, well, I feel fine. OK, then don't test. So this issue of uh, antigen and tests in Omicron, Daniel talked about this two weeks ago. And the, the preprint he mentioned is, Direct comparison of SARS-CoV-2 nasal RT-PCR and rapid antigen tests, Binax now, at a community testing site during an Omicron surge. So in January, 731 people who sought testing at a walk-up San Francisco community site, they gave them simultaneous Binax now and RT-PCR on the same sample. So then they, they're reporting on this. 296 positives by RT-PCR, 97% of which were Omicron. The sensitivity of a single antigen test was, I mean, these numbers are going to be hard to remember, 92%, 82%, and 65% for CT thresholds of less than 30, less than 35, and no threshold, respectively. So as you go up with the CT, the sensitivity of the antigen test is dropping, as you would expect, right? Right. A single Binax now antigen test detected 95% of high viral load Omicron cases. So that is less than 30. Okay, so it makes sense. If you are if you have a lot of RNA, you're going to have a lot of antigen. Yeah. So in the same paper, they didn't say whether or not, well, probably all these, these people are going to urgent care. So they're probably symptomatic. They're going to a testing site. Yeah. Well, they aren't necessarily, tested, but they got a reason to go to a testing site. They had a reason to go to a testing site. Yeah. So they conclude as currently recommended, Repeat testing should be done for high-risk persons with an initial negative antigen test result. All right, so if you're high-risk and you feel something, you're sick, and you're negative on antigen, you should you should have a repeat PCR. Okay. Yeah. The, well, and and if you read the instructions of the um, Binax test. Yeah. Um, if you're a person like me who reads instructions. Yeah, I read them and, too, yeah. <laughs> and or um, teach classes about this and yeah. really were interested in it. Um, it does specifically tell you, you should take both of the tests in the package uh, That's about right. 12 hours apart. That's absolutely right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember reading. I, actually, I thought those instructions were well done. They were, I did they were, too. I was, they were well I made a whole class with them. I mean, it's I not skimmed the case. over that part. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, my dad actually just had this experience um, and uh, and just turned 81 the other day. So he is high risk by definition. Mm -hmm. And um, he felt a little crummy and took a rapid antigen test and it was negative. Mm -hmm. And his doctor prescribed some Tamiflu and, um, <laughs> and which, you know, is not the not necessarily no, a bad okay. idea in that situation. <laughs> um, so uh, and then he felt a little crummier and, and also got a PCR test and um, that was positive. Mm. So, and then he, he had a course of mild COVID-19, which he handled completely at home and isolated for the recommended number of days, even though he's in Florida and there are no rules there. Um, he, uh, you know, followed, followed protocols and, and it was, he said it was, it was about like, you know, a bad winter cold that yeah. experiences every few years. And that's that. Did he Price take another there. rapid antigen test? Uh, he did not take another rapid antigen test. Dang. He had his answer. I know, yeah. <laughs> they should have seen the real live. Yeah. Did, did it go out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing rapid antigen test. Rapid antigen test. I'm if surprised. You, if that test positive, you're in serious. I, I'm surprised the doc didn't give him a rapid flu antigen test. No, I guess not. I mean, went, went straight maybe the, the doctor flu. said, too many tests. The hell with it. Here, take 10. Yeah. <laughs> All Tamiflu. right. Um, Alan, can you take the next one? It's Anthony. Anthony writes, uh, the Charles Lee of Fort Lee does not appear related to Robert E. Lee. During the War of Independence, Robert E. Lee's father led a spectacular raid in what became Jersey City. Hmm. In 1779, he led a handful of men on a night raid on pa Paulus Hook, New Jersey. The men marched 30 miles in wet terrain that damaged their gunpowder. 
armed only with bayonets when they arrived, they took the British completely by surprise and captured 158 prisoners. Huh. So his okay. father, Robert E. Lee's father, was in the Independence in the Revolutionary War. War. How about that? Yeah. Huh. Warrior, I that's cool. I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't either. I had a suspicion that Fort Lee might be related to the character in Hamilton. Um, hmm. There is a Charles Lee character in Hamilton who's involved in a who's duel early on. And I thought that might this. be the same uh, one with Fort Lee, hmm. um, but I wasn't sure. And he's not a character that gets a, a great um, story in Hamilton. So it, at least at that moment, it didn't seem like somebody you'd name a town after, but he probably did more than that. <laughs> Okay, one more, Rich. Uh, Damien writes, Dear esteemed professors, it was with some significant horror that I was informed of the great powers of scientists to create life. Allow me to paraphrase. Quote, the bacteria has computers for parents. End quote. Leo Laporte had a futuristic speaking about synthetic biology near the end of the episode. And the suggestion was we have such a good understanding of the genetic code that we can create life or design sequences that would target an individual. Once again, I paraphrase, quote, companies would have a fiduciary requirement to disclose to the market if the CEO was to become sick, end quote. <clears throat> I do not believe either of the above is possible with our current understanding of biology, nor the techniques we currently have. I would write to uh, Leo outlining this, but I believe that you all would have much more credibility than a PhD qualified chemist who left academia over 20 years ago. While I remain scientifically curious with a broad interest beyond chemistry of photosynthesis, which was my PhD topic, I do not feel mm -hmm. I am sufficiently across the cutting edge of microbiology to counter Ms. Webb's assertions. I think it is dangerous for the public to think uh, what was presented is realistic today. I hope that you may wish to listen to the podcast, then reach out and possibly uh, present to Leo's audience the true state of the art of what is possible. Yours sincerely, Damien, who's from Australia, says, please excuse poor grammar spelling as I am writing this on my phone. <laughs> BPS, it is a warm 30 degrees centigrade day with very light cloud cover and calm winds. No, okay. you can't, so cre does he can't create life. No. 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 So we do not know enough to be able to do anything like that. So Leo Laporte is off his rocker. Uh, <laughs> well, the guest he, is anyway. Yeah, um, I mean, I think this was a guest on the show, a futurist. Yes. I mean, uh, Leo yes. Laporte is the host of This Week in Tech, which was the inspiration for okay. this uh, particular podcast. But, um, he doesn't answer his email. He's said it many times on his show. So there's no way I could get his attention. So I know his wife. I could probably get her Those attention. Those famous but... podcasters who don't answer their email. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> um, so I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm sorry. It's not right. But, um, you know, that the, you say things like that, you get attention. That's how you, you get a lot of people listening to your podcast. You say things that aren't correct, that are, but s seem sensational. All right, let me read this last short one. It's from Alex. Hi, guys. So when I first tuned in and heard you start the show with your weather reports, I thought, man, it was a little curious. But fine, it's your thing. I live in the UK, so I started to notice that when you get snow, I get snow about two weeks later. In fact, knowing about your weather turned out to be rather useful. <laughs> also, Vincent, you mentioned not liking Vince. So in my head, your name is now spelt Vincent. So it's V I N C E N apostrophe T. <laughs> Vince not. Vince not. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. good. Keep up the good work, Alex. That's very good. Vince not. All right. Time for some picks. By the way, Kathy puts in a note to remind us there's a vaccine town hall scheduled for Monday, January 31st, 2022, 7 p.m. Eastern. Go to asv.org slash education to register. Brianne, what do you have for us? So I had an article that I thought was a really interesting read um, from The Atlantic called How Sesame Street is Handling the Pandemic. 
And this is basically talking about the principles that they are using for their science communication to talk about the pandemic and vaccines for kids. Um, they have three main principles, um, which I think are probably key for all of us with our science communication, um, which are context, clarity, and care. Um, and thinking about ways to try to explain things clearly, um, but also understand that kids don't have the ability in some cases to make the decision if they're going to get their vaccine because their mom or dad might be doing uh, making some decisions. Um, but how to sort of explain without being scary. Um, and I'm, I thought it was a fascinating way to think about how you message this, but also it was really exciting to me to know that there are people who are thinking about this and thinking about how we make sure to message to kids. Nice. Cool. Yeah. More importantly, I'm looking at the table of contents. This looks like an interesting magazine. Atlantic? <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, just, I just subscribed the other yeah, day. I, yeah, I subscribed to the Atlantic. I really like the Atlantic. Yeah, <laughs> I great. mean, uh, A lot of the good science... Uh, a lot, uh, a lot of the good uh, science writers show yeah. up there. Yeah, yeah, they have. Oh, yeah, good. this is this is Ed Yong's regular, uh, yeah, regular Ka gig. Uh, Catherine or is it Catherine yeah, so Wu? It's, um, Ed yeah. Yong, Catherine Wu. Um, there's one Sarah Zhang. There are a few, yeah. and I felt like that was one where I was willing to spend some money to support yep. that kind of science writing. So I, I've, I've subscribed for a couple of years. But also, the yeah. non-science articles are interesting as well. Yep. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're all they great. Look good. Okay. Brian, I, I got Brian. Rich, what do you have for us? <laughs> and twice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how this came up, uh, except that it's something I've been interested in for a long time. This is how a Zamboni works. <laughs> uh, this may have been triggered by I when I, at Thanksgiving when I was in Boston, I went to a Bruins game, yeah. and I, I uh, I'm always fascinated by the Zambonis. The okay. best part of a hockey game. It yeah. is. It <laughs> is. <laughs> yes, they're great. So this is actually from the. Zamboni.com. Okay, this is the real source. And if anybody wants to know the origin of the term Zamboni, you're probably not surprised to Frank realize Zamboni. that there was Frank Zamboni <laughs> who invented the machine. Yep. Uh, and there's somewhere I, I found, I looked at a number of different things to come up with this. There's a, a YouTube thing somewhere on the uh, history of Frank Zamboni and the invention uh, of this machine. But the interesting thing is that the real business end of the Zamboni is the thing it drags behind, okay? And it does three things. It's got a big blade in front of it that shaves up a layer of ice, and then there's a couple of augers that, that move that ice up and throw it into the big huh. thing in the front. So all of that space in the front is for collecting the ice that's been shaved up that gets dumped away later on. Then behind that, <clears throat> there's another piece of the apparatus. There's two more tanks under the big tank. One is for wash water and one is for new water. Okay. And the wash water is recirculated between the blade and uh, a thing behind that that ultimately lays down the new water. And, and the wash water actually gets flowed out onto the ice and then vacuumed up and circulated back into the wash water tank. So they actually rinse the ice after they shave it. Hmm. And then there's another tank that uh, feeds a, a pipe that's behind the wash water pipe that lays down some new water. And then there's a cloth that sort of smooths that out. And that's what you see coming out of the back of the machine uh, that is new ice. Terrific. So you can, yeah. I had to sort of dig through this to get that whole thing, but it's there. I love the Zamboni, yeah. And yeah, the thing is, yeah. it's so mesmerizing to just watch that. And then <laughs> yeah. it finishes, it pulls into its little its cubicle. Little cave. Yes. They close the door, and then the, the hockey players come out and screw it all up again. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, Zamboni drivers also, there's a particular pattern that they follow. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That must be the most efficient way to do this yep. without running over your tracks again or something I like, like that. When they, uh, I, I like when they go at the very edge and they do the curve. Around, yes. they do the whole circle. <laughs> yeah, it's just great. Love it. Zamboni. Ah, it's, it's making me hungry. Speaking of... <laughs> Go get yourself a Zamboni. No, Alan, Alan, what do you have for us? 
I have um, an article about a about a really cool experiment. This is radio astronomy, which is totally not my field, but it, it it's just really cool what they did here. Um, so they used one one of the big questions in atmospheric physics is what causes lightning, right? And it was kind of I saw this article. I was like, wait. We don't know what causes lightning. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, seems that's like, distressing. A, like a rather important question to answer. Um, and there, you know, there's obviously a lot known about it. And it is it is static electricity from the cloud going, you know, to the mm. ground. And um, but the details of how that happens, there are a couple of models about how it happens and how the static electricity in the thunderstorm reaches that critical level but none of them had really been proven one way or another. So there was this controversy. And so these folks used a network of radio telescopes to watch thunderstorms um, in, in the Netherlands. And they managed to get actual real-time model mm. of the formation of lightning. And it's really cool. And it shows what which one of these models is correct and i won't spoil that for you but um but you can you can go ahead and read about how this was set up and and how they drilled into the data to get this real time there's an animation in the article if you play it you can see nice. the, the formation cool. of the spark awesome hmm. yeah that's cool i just thought that was neat yeah i would have thought don't they know how to do this how this is done yet? <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> cool. don't we know everything about lightning shouldn't we <laughs> Uh, my I pick again, which is another YouTube cooking channel. This one is called <laughs> Buon Appetiti. It is uh, <clears throat> combines the phrase Buon Appetito, of course, with the name of the lady Gina. Uh, her last name is Petiti. Okay, and uh, Gina is the star of this show. She's a grandmother, so another name for the show is uh, Cooking with Grandma. Uh, born in 1935 in Italy, uh, and um, there's <laughs> you can send fan mail. Apparently, it's in New Jersey, <laughs> so she might actually live there. But she reminds me of my grandmother because she talks with a really high voice in a Italian <laughs> accent. You have to boil for a long time, and um, <laughs> she put, brings you through all these uh, things that she makes, which are traditional Italian things, which I had as a kid. Uh, almond cookies, zeppole, <clears throat> roasted chestnuts. Actually, I follow her a recipe for roasted chestnuts. Um, so I, we always used to make chestnuts in our family around the holidays. And I just remember my grandfather, he would take one of those metal pans with the holes in it and he would put it on the stove and mm -hmm. he would roast the chestnuts and they came out beautifully. And I have tried that for years. And they always screw up. I don't know what's wrong with them. I mean, it doesn't hurt that half of them are moldy because they're old or whatever. Anyway, so she boils them first for 15 minutes uh, and then um, puts them in the oven to dry. And then she says, if you want, you can roast them in a pan on the stove too. <laughs> so I did that and it worked really well. Meatloaf, uh, this is not one of my favorite liver and onions. No, my grandfather used to love it. I can't. <laughs> no, I'm not eating that. Pasta primavera. Anyway, so this is uh, traditional Italian cooking. And I, obviously one of her kids is filming this in her kitchen. And uh, it's just charming because not professional and, and really good recipes. Uh, it's, it, this is a whole cookbook. Yeah. It's a whole cookbook. Yeah. Italian grandma makes chicken marsala. Yeah. Italian go grandma. For that. Really this, fun. This looks Awesome, and now you're making me hungry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Is, this is Italian food makes you hungry. So this is good stuff. I don't know how much longer I'll be picking these, but this is one that I always, my wife watches it all the time. We have a, a listener pick from Micah. So it's spelled M-E-I-K-A, but she says at the bottom, Micah as in the, as in the uh, mineral Hi, super scientists. My husband and I were driving home from a weekend isolating on the shore of Washington State, listening to Twiv on the way home. Vincent began to introduce the usual favorite folks on the show, and finally when he announced Brianne, we both cheered out loud. We love you all, but I have to say that Brianne has brought... We love you all, but we like Brianne better. That's what she's saying. <laughs> it's basically, yes. <laughs> has brought a certain clarity to the very murky and confusing world 
of immunology, I no longer feel slightly lost about the cellular details that can be discussed in some episodes. You you no longer feel slightly lost. Now you feel completely lost. Completely lost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember listening to a TWIV episode at least seven plus years ago. Yes, I've been a fan for that long. And the episode had a lot of immunology and it was probably 75% acronyms and abbreviations. Maybe it was Gabriel Victoria. <laughs> and then 25% actual words that I understood. It was mind boggling. Brianna is like the perfect tour guide to help your readers understand it all. Thank you for bringing her into the herd. I have a pick. My husband recently found a game online called Wordle. Ah. Has have you picked this before, uh, Alan? Wordle? No, but this no. is no. This has playing. gone completely we all play it all the time. viral. Yeah. I have okay. not. I have not bitten into it yet. Oh, I have. Um, oh, okay. it's really fun, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It is. Uh, a simple game where you try to guess a five-letter word in less than six tries with some clues that you arrive at by your previous guesses. It's fun and quick enough to be entertaining, but also <laughs> makes one think enough to be challenging. Thank you for the community that you have given your listeners. We all feel like you are our colleagues and friends, Micah. Well, wow. Th thanks, Micah. Oh, my I absolutely second Micah's uh, uh Kudos to Brienne. I have my wife learned. is going to annihilate this. She is a crossword wizard. Oh, oh yeah. So, so have, do you have, did you ever know of a game called Mastermind? Yes, yes. it's Mastermind. Yes. With so it's letters. it's Mastermind, yeah. Mastermind but a word letters. game. Yeah. Yes, it's a fabulous. <laughs> uh, so Brienne, I have uh, you know I, I've written to you about this. I have gotten an immunology education over the last year and a half that I very much appreciate. So. Uh, here, here. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> but what, what happened was years ago, um, we we said, who wants to, what women want to join TWIV? We made a call and we had a few people, uh, and Brian was one of them. She volunteered uh, to join us and uh, she came on and she stayed. It worked. I think you came to New York for that first episode. Is that right? I I did come to visit New York at one point. Uh, I think that was a little bit beforehand. I just uh, was emailing with you and came into New York. Yeah, I ran into you at ASM, and, and so, so yeah. I knew you actually yeah. already. Yeah. yeah. So that's the so story. Increasing our gender diversity also got us a, a wonderful <laughs> immunology insight that we hadn't even realized yeah. we were missing, and yeah. now we can't do without. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, of course, then we started an immunology podcast without Brienne yeah. initially, and then we decided that she really belonged there. So now she's on both. Well, but she can't leave here. She can't because, leave no. no, 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 no. That's we're not letting her go. No. Wow. Thanks. So apparently, this is the I get random compliments day. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a twiv eight five eight microbe.tv slash twiv for the show notes, questions, and comments, picks twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, for example, you appreciate the community we've made, you should consider supporting us. You don't have to give a lot, but enough of you, if you all gave a little bit, it would really help us bring this incubator forward to make it the science education company that uh, we'd like it to be. So you can go to, well, for the rest of January, which isn't very long now, uh, you can go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and uh, Daniel will match your donation and give it back to us, which is very nice. Otherwise, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We're a 501c3, so your contributions are tax deductible. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Alan Dove's at alandove.com, Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thanks, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Get vaccinated. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral.